you were on last year. And, That's and right, with Kyle. With Kyle, and we didn't really, I, I really felt like we, I had no idea how extensive your background was. <laughs> I mean, you've done everything, and I've only touched the tip of the iceberg, and so I, I can't get to everything in your resume up front, or we'd spend all time reading your resume. Yeah, I have to read it, too, to remind myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at that point in life yeah, as right. well. Um, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did that? Let me write down the title of your book so I can say it again. It's called uh, Stopping a Taiwan Invasion. All right. And it's exclusively on Amazon. Not that we really wanted to do it that way, but That's okay. that was the option. As I said, I've got, I've, you've got this, we'll get to some of your biography. We can't do all of it. And, well, you can do what you want. I mean, you know the gist of what we want to cover. Our, you know, well, I, I gather you want to talk about Taiwan and China and, and, and Ukraine. And Ukraine. And I think the lead's got to be Ukraine, at least. Okay. Where That's we fine. are right now, my concerns. Okay. Okay, we good to go? This is the Bill Walton Show, May 11th. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics, and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Today's show is about my growing concern about whether Joe Biden could lead us into a nuclear war over Ukraine, while at the same time, China looms in its ambitions to take over Taiwan. Well, I'm not an expert in this, and, and, and nor are most, most of us, but uh, we need to be paying attention. Uh, the Russians increasingly believe that they are at war with NATO, not just Ukraine. So much so that Sergei Lerov, uh, Russian's foreign minister, has said the threat of nuclear war should not be underestimated and that the danger is serious. China is running a dedicated campaign to uproot the rules-based order that has existed in the Indo-Pacific region since the end of World War II and is also continuing its largest buildup in military history, or its largest military buildup in history. Um, its fleet, Naval fleet projected to be about 460 surface warships uh, by the end of the decade. My view, Joe Biden and his foreign policy team is no way equipped to deal with these and other national security issues, including Iran. But I don't see Republicans offering uh, any alternatives right now. Um, in fact, most are mindlessly upping the ante alongside with uh, Biden and what's going on in Ukraine. With me, to help understand this is one of the wisest national security experts around, Dr. Stephen Byron. Welcome, Byron. Welcome back. Thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, Stephen has uh, over 50 years' experience in government and industry, senior staff director in the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee, deputy undersecretary of defense for trade security policy, the founder and first director of the Defense Technology Security Administration, President in private sector, CEO experience, which is important to me in any event. Uh, president of Delta Tech and president of uh, Finmanica North America, and was commissioner of the U.S. China Security Review Commission. That's right. Um, Stevens been called the Yoda of the arms trade. He was the Pentagon's top cop, the man whose job it was to ensure that sensitive technology would be kept from enemies, potential enemies and questionable allies. His major study is Technology, Security, and National Power, Winners and Losers, that covers strategic issues, um, defense, uh, technology transfers, proliferation of uh, weapons, the whole gamut of things that threaten our country. And most recently, and what we want to talk about today in part, is his book, Stopping a Taiwan Invasion. And it, it's something that we're not paying enough attention to, but it could loom much larger on our security screen than, uh, yes. than Ukraine does. Yes. So, Stephen, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be with you. So last time you were here, we talked about the debacle of, of us departing Afghanistan. <laughs> yes, that's a while ago now. And well, it didn't almost seem, ancient history. Almost ancient history, months ago. Yes. And it didn't seem like it'd get worse. But it has. <laughs> And, and, on, and, and in multiple ways, it's gotten worse. Um, I think the Ukraine thing is very dangerous 
for us, and I think we have baited it to a large extent, uh, and the Russians understand it that way too. Uh, not that they were nice guys, they were awful, totally awful. But I think it's in our interest to maintain the peace in Europe and to not have things escalate, um, not get to face the potential of nuclear weapons, which I think is a horrible potential, something that we have to work very hard to avoid at all costs. And uh, unfortunately, we're going in the wrong direction, I believe. So where do you, what's your assessment of where we are? It's very hard for those of us that don't know it. Well, maybe we should go back and understand let's what came. Let's go back. Came, let's, let's go, how, do we, how do we get to where we how are? How we got to where we are. Okay. Yeah. Starting around 2014, when the Russians grabbed Crimea, the U.S. started, the U.S. and NATO, but mainly the U.S., uh, started uh, supporting Ukraine with the armaments, and more than that, with with special military training. The Russians saw that increasingly as an attempt by Washington to build up enough capability in Ukraine to attack the Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine, which are in the east, the northeast, and down into the southern part of Ukraine. And they saw it as, as, a, as a threat, plain and simple. Uh, the Ukrainians, along with their two republic, so-called republics in Luhansk and Donetsk in eastern Ukraine, which uh, uh, declared their independence, their separation from Ukraine uh, in 2014. And, and so in 2014, there was an attempt to reconcile that and it didn't exactly work. The second one took place in 2015. Both of them who, were... Who was at the table trying to reconcile well, I'm going to come that. to that. Okay. Yeah, because okay. the yeah. people at the table were the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Luhansk People's Republic, and the Donetsk People's Republic. And it was overseen. The, the whole deal was overseen. And it was done in Minsk, by the way. It's called the Minsk Agreement. Uh, it was done in Minsk, the second agreement, in 2015. It was overseen by the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, which was primarily Germany and France. So they were kind of the brokers. The, the deal was, there were a number of provisions, including a ceasefire, including uh, exchanging of prisoners from both sides and all that. But the key, it seems to me, the key provision was, was the following. It said that Luhansk and Donetsk should become uh, not independent, but autonomous within Ukraine. Autonomous. And that the, but they would still be under Ukrainian law, uh, and that the Ukrainian parliament would pass a, a resolution approving this autonomy. Um, and that was the basis for a negotiation, because saying that is not saying what it is. You have to really figure out what that means. The Ukrainians thereafter refused to negotiate on the, under the Minsk agreement, and in particular didn't want to talk about autonomy. Uh, not at all. So they simply balked. They, were, they refused. And the U.S. has, generally speaking, encouraged that. While the Russians have said, look, there's an agreement. We are in favor of the agreement. Let's sit down and negotiate it. So the, you know, the Russian position was this should be negotiated under the 2015 Minsk Agreement. The uh, position of the Europeans, which is especially France and Germany, was more or less the same as the Russian one. Let's sit down and negotiate, but the Ukrainians could not be persuaded to do that. Washington stayed out of it openly, but privately, I believe, Washington encouraged the Ukrainians to resist negotiating saying that, you know, we'll build you up sufficiently, you don't have to give away any territory, you don't this have to make any This was with the deals. Obama administration. Started with the Obama administration. Okay. But it <clears> continued. <throat> I mean, it's, it's <throat> not just Obama. It was under Trump the same thing, and it's now under Biden the same thing, and worse, and worse. So, so that was the, the, the Washington position. So it was at odds with our friends in Europe, although it was not, it was not at odds with NATO, which is rather peculiar, but... NATO backed the Washington position, more or less. 
and got in a very harsh mood regarding the Russians. And in fact, the Russians uh, had a, NATO, uh, a mission in NATO, about 10 people, if I remember right, uh, sitting in Brussels. And, the, and NATO had a mission in Moscow with about the same number of people. Basically, the NATO threw out the Russians from that mission in Brussels. So, of course, the Russians reciprocated, did the same thing in Moscow. So the, rela the relationship with NATO became quite harsh over Ukraine, over Ukraine, which is not a member of NATO. <laughs> you know, it is part of a NATO program where, you know, states that, that have ambitions to join NATO are given special status, let's call it that, but they're not covered under the NATO treaty, which is a, a, basically a self-defense treaty that says, a, con, a collective defense, which says if an attack on one happens, all the others will respond. And that's under what's called Article 5 of the NATO treaty. So to, put a, to, to make a long story short, which I think is probably a good idea right now, uh, <laughs> we have a situation where NATO is hostile to, uh, to the Russians and, and supporting Ukraine. We have a Washington administration which is supporting Ukraine, but we have the Germans and the French uh, under the Minsk agreements where they're guarantors, it's called the Normandy Group, uh, who are trying to broker some kind of deal based on what was agreed in 2015 at Minsk. So why do we care about Ukraine? Um, I, this mean, is I, a, I, I want to compare and contrast to Taiwan, and I think we ought to care yeah, a lot well, we don't have it. any. But, but what, what's our strategic interest in Ukraine? Why did we feel like we needed to do this? Uh, my interpretation of it is that we want to block the Russians in the Black Sea. The that's, only warm water port they that's have. That's right. That's okay. their only warm water port. In yeah. other words, uh, as the Russians say, you know, essentially to surround them, because once their navy is blocked, they only have a, uh, uh, a serious port uh, on the Polish coast, which is very much isolated, and then you have to go into the frozen areas of the north, so the White Sea. So I think basically what you have is is a is an attempt to keep them out of the Black Sea. Uh, to make it difficult for them to expand, if they, you know, the threat was, and Washington thinks that Putin and his government want to reclaim territories that they lost when the Soviet Union collapsed. So you had the Georgia mess, uh, which the Russians were aggressors at, of right. course, and you had Crimea, and now you have Eastern Ukraine, and so the, you know the U.S position is we'll squeeze you back. <laughs> uh, it, the, the trouble is the, the Russians see themselves in a conflict, not with Ukraine so much as they see themselves in a conflict with the United States and with NATO. Well, that's increasingly clear. clear. They're correct. Yeah. I believe they're correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, from their point of view, they're surely correct. Um, uh, now, they're, they don't want it to, I mean, I think the Russians, even though they make some threats here and there, they've threatened, uh, you know, the, the some of the Baltic states, and they've threatened uh, uh, Poland a little bit. And, and, uh, but I think basically the, the, the Russians don't want to see this war expand uh, because they're going to lose if, they, if it expands, and, and we're all going to lose. Now, are you surprised? Uh, oh, this is the Bill Walton Show. I'm here talking with Dr. Uh, Stephen Bryan about uh, Ukraine and how we got uh, where we are now, and I want to we're going to go right now to talk about how we might get us out of where we are now. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but were you surprised that the Russians had such trouble uh, dealing with Ukraine? Because you know the weapons and the capabilities. Well, I, I, I was. I mean, I think everybody was surprised about how uh, the level of competence was far below what we believed the Russians. You know, we've watched the Russians do military exercises. Um, over the years, and in fact, they've even invited the, until the most recent Zapit exercise, where they didn't invite us, but but uh, for obvious reasons. But the, you know, we have watched them exercise, and they look quite formidable. But we're seeing all kinds of flaws in in, in their approach, and and they're missing a lot of technology. I'm a technology buff. Uh, I follow military technology pretty carefully. 
And the thing well, you're you, only the chief procurement officer. <laughs> not a guy, procurement. So I, was, I, I, would, I would, yes. <laughs> I was, I was uh, the, the chief bad guy trying to stop technology from going to the Soviet Union. That was my, my uh, mandate, and we did that um, very successfully, actually. And maybe it's still successful, which is rather surprising. Hmm. Uh, but in fact, we've seen cases where modern equipment is missing from Russian aircraft. It's missing from Russian tanks. Uh, their air defenses aren't working right. I mean, there's a lot of things that are really not functioning the way one would have expected. Yes, so I was surprised. Quite. Is that incompetence? Is it... Uh, I, what, what are the... What it's are the... a mixed bag. Uh, some of it's a lack of good doctrine. Okay. Some of it's a real lack of good training. I think that's a major issue here. Some of it's a lack of technology. I mean, they're missing pieces, that sh like the Su-25s, which is a fairly old plane, but it was a Soviet uh, ground attack airplane. Uh, it doesn't have targeting pods. So how can you hit anything if you don't have a targeting pod? But they never put them on them. I mean, it's unbelievable. And then finally, I think there's a matter of corruption. I think Russian, the Russian system is corrupt, front to back, up and down. I mean, we, we know that anyway from the top-level leadership, but I think it goes deep and all the way through the military. Where do we go from here? Well, I mean, the question is, do we want to let this thing grind on? At the end of the day, I, I think, don't think we do. I don't. I, I, you know, my, my world's economic. Yeah. It's, it's a catastrophe. Oh, for economically for Ukraine? It's Well, it's, bad for the United States, it's bad for Europe. Yeah. I mean, the whole... It, it, it's very destructive. And of course, it's bad for human beings who are getting killed by the thousands in Ukrainian cities uh, by bombings and other kinds of attacks. But right now, it, it seems to be slightly stalemated. Um, somehow, Zelensky has to decide. I mean, I think he could get himself a good deal right now. Um, Yes, he will have to give some form of autonomy to, to uh, eastern Ukraine, but it, there doesn't have to be an, a Russian army in eastern Ukraine. There doesn't even have to be a local army in eastern Ukraine. There doesn't have to be any army in eastern Ukraine. I mean, what autonomy may mean has to be defined. One of the things that, that the Russians have made a case out of, and I don't know that it's totally justified, but in eastern Ukraine, the language is Russian. People speak Russian. And the Ukrainian parliament said, you can't do that anymore when it comes to any official business. You can't do it in the schools. You can't teach Russian language. You can't teach Russian, Russian literature. You can't go to the doctors and speak Russian to the doctor. I mean, those were the kind of things that were going on. And the Russians took serious umbrage uh, that the Ukrainian parliament would, would do that because they've always felt that there's a connection between Ukrainians and, and Russians. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Zelensky could get a good deal today, but he's not willing, you know, he's at least so far, he's really not willing to negotiate. Well, the thing that troubles me, and I mentioned in the open, none of our national security leaders seem to be remotely interested in trying to sit down and cut a deal. No, they, want to bleed the, they want to bleed the Russians. And they've said it. Well. I mean, the, the, Lloyd Austin said, we want to bleed the Russians. He made it clear. I mean, if, if that's, that's, you know, we'll and send you more can go weapons. And down to the, the line, and you've got Mike McCall, you know, saying, you know, you, 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 and then you've got Nancy Pelosi in a press conference with, uh, who's our favorite uh, congressman from Hollywood? Uh, um, remember the, uh, anyway, uh, uh, Adam uh, Schiff. Oh, uh, <laughs> telling would, us we're going to The word go, favorite threw me off. We're, well, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't quite mean it that way. I know. Um, going in, they're standing on the steps of Zelensky saying, we're all in. We're going to, America's totally committed to defeating Russia. So right. circling back to the guy in the room, Putin, I mean, we, we can see our people out piling on, upping the ante, saying we're going to reduce them. Then we've got Putin that, is operating a machine that didn't turn out to be quite the machine everybody thought it was, and he's at least seeing his options uh, uh, increasingly limited. How does a guy like that react, which leads to the, the nuclear Or does question? he even survive? 
I mean, in, in turn, you know, the, the, I guess somehow they think they can keep squeezing the Russians and Putin will still be there, but that's not necessarily the case at all. I mean, he's, he's got internal opposition, not, not from the, I would call from the left, from the peace side, but from the right, from the, from the we need to do his more. Fill, his fellow of oligarchs? I don't think it's the oligarchs. I think it's mostly coming from, from the military side. And the military side wants to escalate. That's right. That's uh, dangerous. Of course it's dangerous because they have nuclear weapons in there. You know, if, if, if Putin is out of the way, I'm worried that we'll get some lunatic who will do things which I think would quick, be disastrous. Quick refresh your course on how lethal a tactical nuclear weapon is. Well, I don't believe there's a, anything called a tactical nuclear okay, weapon. Okay, that's what I wanted to yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think there, there are big and little nuclear weapons. Um, <laughs> this is a little one. A smallish one, okay, but a smallish one, maybe five kilotons. I mean, these are pretty dangerous. How big was the one in Hiroshima? Eighteen. Okay, so give you an idea. It yeah. took out a whole city, um, and then Nagasaki, I think, was thirteen. Um, so it's order of magnitude. These are these the, would yeah, be today's yeah. be kind of tactical. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to think of it that way. But right. you know, the, the, the nuclear weapon is not a very good war-making weapon. Because it really, if you're using it against the other army, you need to be able to catch the other army kind of in you know, one place you can knock them off. And the and whole, that's, that's uh, not it's not going on in Ukraine. No. They're, they're doing ambushes, they're yeah. running, they're not in one place at any one time. This is why the Russians are having so much trouble. So they can't use a nuclear weapon that way. What you would use it for is, you know, the terrible thing is against the city. And that would be horrible. That would be a disaster, and it will trigger off possible nuclear war, a bigger war in Europe. So, I mean, the whole idea is, is, is very, very unnerving. Well, our side, our, our national security establishment believes that's unthinkable. But as I talk to people... I don't know people, that's true. Well, no. they may think it's unthinkable. Well, no, but I mean, the intelligence guys have been warning, have been warning Biden that... There's a danger of escalation here to yeah, nuclear what's, level. What's your community saying? I mean, you've you've know everybody in this, and a lot of I think they're scared. Yeah, I think they're really scared that the Russians, if you squeeze them too hard, you know, the Russians have taken heavy losses. You know, I don't know how many hundreds of tanks have been blown up. Yeah, how many airplanes have been lost? Helicopters have been lost, and and wounded, killed, and wounded is a very high number. Some say 20,000 killed. So you can multiply by four the number wounded. So that's a huge number of people. So what would you do, what would you advise President Biden? I think the, the, I, I think the Biden administration should tell the Europeans and tell Zelensky that it's time to sit down and figure this out. I agree. That's what I think should be done. Uh, I think the Europeans are dying to have this uh, over with because it's threatening their economies and it's threatening war. They haven't worried about war in Europe for you know years and years, um, and it would be totally destructive of uh, everything they've achieved. So I mean they don't want it. By the way, it also threatens NATO. I mean NATO won't be here if if there's a war. That'll be the end of NATO, I believe. Because the modern war was, you know, you can't win it. You simply can't win it, especially on a highly industrialized landscape like Europe. So it would just be disastrous. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, that you know, one guy in Ukraine, I mean, look, I, I, I feel for the Ukrainian people. I think it's terrible what's happened to them. Not that in many ways they didn't <laughs> stimulate to some extent they, they could have been more clever. They could have negotiated earlier. Um, they've proven now that they can fight. They've proven that they're, they they that they want to protect their homeland. I think that's all great, but I think there are bigger issues, and those bigger issues affect Europe and they affect the United States and the world. So we're at the point where instead of rah rah, we have to get serious and and push for a negotiation. And I think the Russians are ready. They've been ready all along, actually. I want to shift gears to Taiwan. Sure. And to Russia. I'm sorry, and to China. China. 
but to segue, this is The Walton Show. I'm talking with Dr. Stephen Byron, and we're talking about how we think they ought to wrap this thing up in Ukraine and get to the negotiating table and, and make peace because the consequences of not doing that are unthinkable. Um, but we've got some other unthinkable scenarios we want to talk about, which is China's intentions uh, with regard to Taiwan. Uh, but to work our way into that, where is China in the Ukraine picture, the Russia picture? Are they... They've been... Well, the Chinese have been very cagey because uh, they don't want to, to be hit with sanctions. Because okay. for their economy, you know. And, and right now, the Chinese economy is a mess, as you probably may know, because of COVID. The COVID knock lockdown is in, what they're doing in well, Shanghai yeah, and if other it's, cities if it, is You know, insane. I've been trying yeah. to figure that out. A lot of people have. I want to get, I'm going to talk with you about that. Okay. Now? Well, let's, yes, in the next, <laughs> in the next 20 minutes, in the next okay. 30 minutes. But I want to get, I want to get what, I want to get what they're thinking about Ukraine, Russia right now, so I can understand whether. Well, I, I think the Chinese, first of all, they're thinking that they don't want to be involved. Okay. They're not doing anything specific that I know about of any importance in regard to helping the Russians, period. Yeah, on an economic front, they're doing some things. They're taking more oil from the Russians. They're, you know, buying more Russian grain, things like that. But, I mean, from the war point of view, they're not doing anything. And they don't want to have their trade with the EU changed. I mean, they they, 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 the EU business for China is huge. Huge. So, and, and it's not inconsequential here either, but the EU is more important. Uh, so, yeah, and they're trying to stay out of it. Um, but maybe they see... I mean, there's a bunch of lessons for the Chinese in this, in this thing. Uh, maybe they see one thing about sanctions is that if there's a war with Taiwan, you know, they're going to get sanctions all over. There's going to be huge sanctions on China. Uh, and, and that's certainly a factor that fits into their thinking. And the other thing is they're seeing what the vulnerabilities of the Russians were so far in, the, in this war. And they're wondering if they have some of the same. Uh, take, for example, Chinese tanks, which are based on Russian tanks, and have some of the same flaws. So I suspect that they're, they're evaluating, or I should, should think, reevaluating everything they have to, and how they're, going, how they're going to go about carrying on a military operation, given what they've seen in the lack of coordination, the lack of interop, you know, interchange between the air and naval and land components, uh, lack of coordination. Those things must be uh, concerning the Chinese right now. Has Xi lost his mind with this COVID-19 response? I mean, I, I, you're so much closer to it, but it seems like a little over two years ago, Wuhan, Wuhan happened, and then the Chinese claimed to lock down Wuhan, and they stopped the virus. Now, some of us were deeply skeptical that that really happened. They didn't report anything, but whether it was a success or not, he claimed a huge success. Right. But I didn't really thought they thought the virus was as lethal as they're seeming to act now. Well, and it's not. We know that because the variant that's going around now is not. Nearly as dangerous. Number one, it's not as lethal. And number two, we've got the juries in on what works and what doesn't work in terms of stopping the virus and locking people in their apartments and shutting down economic doesn't activity. Work. Doesn't work. Right. So uh, you get these smart Chinese, and they are smart, acting in this incredible way. You know, in 1986, I was in Beijing with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I was sent there by... <laughs> the Pentagon. Well, that's when we're all going to be living happily ever well, after. Right, we Those were, we were good old days. living too happily. But anyway, <laughs> um, and I had heard on the VOA that morning about riots in Shanghai and one other place. I forget where. Um, and we're in the car going out to uh, visit an installation, a Landsat installation, which the U.S. put there. And I have three scientists with me, all who spoke nice English, and a driver who didn't. And I said, did you hear about the riots in Shanghai? And the scientist said, no, no, no. And there's quiet silence. We drive a little further, still silence. And the driver, in perfect English, 
spoke no English, but in perfect English, said, yeah, I heard it this morning on the VOA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shanghai is a very sensitive place. There were riots there in 86, and there were riots subsequently during Tiananmen. Um, there has been opposition to Xi in Shanghai. And I'm wondering, is this political? Is this something designed to, to shut down Shanghai to because he's facing re-election soon, uh, and maybe he's got opponents that we don't know about. That seems to be a deep game he could be playing. Could I, be a deep game. I don't it, have it, any. It seems any to be political direct... and punitive rather than public health. That's how it looks to me too. But didn't they have a Politburo meeting? A small group of people that met last week, and if he has enemies, they're not in that room because they came out with renewed vigor to keep. Uh, to keep Shanghai, Shanghai shut down. Right. No, I don't think they're in that room at all. So Some of them are in jail. Well, yeah, he disappears people routinely. Right. Uh, and, and, and some of them are in the military. So I'm not sure what, what the deal is, but, I mean, you have to get to a real China expert, which I'm not. But yeah. uh, it seems to me that you shouldn't take this on face value as a COVID exercise. Well, we do know that he wants to be elected for a third term. There is the plenary thing or whatever, the big meeting. And yeah. It's supposed to be in fall. There's some chance he could accelerate that to July. So, oh, is there? I didn't hear that. So yeah. he could he could get it done. Before, um, before people riot completely. and Before people riot completely. Yeah. And he wants to accelerate that. I, I, but the other deeper game was also... The sanctions are really hurting Russia, obviously, but they're also really hurting Europe, and they're really hurting the United States. And, you know, try to buy, food's expensive now and scarce now. Try next year when we don't have any of the fertilizer from uh, right. from uh, the usual sources in Europe. The yeah, corn is going to be a big issue. And Do Biden still wants to put it in your gas tank. Yeah, ethanol. Up, let's up that to 15. Yeah, so you can but, pay yeah. $6 a gallon instead of 5 yeah, <laughs> sure, I will like that. Uh, probably the only place it does. Uh, so you've got the sanctions there. And then what Xi's doing, though, with Shanghai, it's the world's largest port, four times larger than Los Angeles. That's right. You get thousands, of, I don't know, thousands is the right number, but infinite number of cargo ships sitting outside there waiting to move stuff in and out. But it's not just Shanghai. He shut down like 75 other cities in, in China. Um, yeah, but Shanghai completely. thinks the biggest one. And, yeah, and, yeah. and plus he shut down, by the way, not only the people's homes, he shut down the subway. Yeah. So I, I well, don't know. Some, something, something much bigger is afoot. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, I but, I, you know, if I had the answer, I would probably go over to the White House and tell them. I'll go over there with you. We'll, yeah, I'm sure right. they'll be happy to see us. I've been so, My crystal ball is I've been not saying very good. so many nice things about Joe Biden. I'm sure he'll, he'll right. welcome me. Uh, <laughs> so let's 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 though so that settles down things maybe we get so we've got Ukraine maybe maybe resolved uncertain but the thing that's looming is their ambition in Taiwan right I mean for people I mean there's a pretty wider there's a wide audience here of people in art subject matter experts explain what Taiwan is I mean what's its brief history well it was originally called Formosa right right it was occupied by the Japanese until 1945 from about, eight, I think it was 1895 to 1945. Um, and, and then, of course, at the end of the war, uh, it reverted to the Formosan people. Uh, and all the people that Mao beat, uh, defeated. Well, that came right after. later, okay, 49. Yeah, 49, 49 and, 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 and the nationalists, the surviving nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek came, uh, evacuated, I guess is the right word, to Taiwan. Um, and they formed a political group, which is the same one they had in China called Guomintang, and uh, and that's the simple history of it. Uh, and they considered themselves the real government of China. So it's not, you know, Taiwan is officially uh, the Republic of China. Still, something the Chinese really dislike. In the, well, they've been. The Chinese have been assiduously working every country in the world to stop recognizing Taiwan. That's and, right. Well, they've succeeded mostly. And mostly. Yeah. Um, 
What is it, Latvia decided not to? And then they changed their mind. Okay. Yeah. After but, they were pr properly but, but bribed. But Taiwan is a real country. I mean, they've also, they've begun to identify It's a terrific themselves. country. It's a democracy. Um, it has a very lively political uh, life. Uh, there are three major parties, but the two biggest ones are the KMT, the Kuomintang, and the DPP, the Dem uh, Democratic People's Party, which is the Green Party, which is in office right now, which is pro-independence. Um, and and then it also has its own language. I mean, the Taiwanese dialect of Chinese has become very popular and is really what most politicians speak. And strategically, it's it it's this it's the home of the largest semiconductor manufacturing uh, operation in the world. That's T right, Taiwan Semi. Yeah. Uh, and it, it but otherwise strategically, it sits right in the middle of the first island chain, and it, of course the Taiwan Straits, which uh, block could block the Chinese Navy. And it's ninety miles off the Chinese coast. Yeah, something like that. Roughly. Not much. Yeah. So it's close. So yeah, but there are parts of Taiwan that was called Kimen or Kimoi, which is one mile from Chinese mainland. So okay, so it's, it's so, so they're they're pretty you know it's pretty close by. Because all the stuff we talk <laughs> about here, it's complicated. Right. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> so, uh, what's the uh, stopping a Taiwan invasion? What's well, the... this is a very important because, you know, Pentagon and a lot of think tanks in town, in the CIA, even as recently as yesterday, keep saying we're going to lose if we have. To if we try to defend Taiwan. And, and so... Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah, uh, you hear it all over. And <clears throat> it seems to me that shouldn't be the case. It's not the case if we do some simple things uh, and, and we're serious to... Uh, and, and so I got together a group with a Lieutenant General, Earl Hailston, who was my co-chairman. We put together a group of military, real military experts who served in the Pacific in senior levels, you know, Pacific Air Force commander, the, the naval naval commander, uh, admirals, uh, admirals and generals, and we put them all, all together for three months. We hacked over this, hashed over this, mm -hmm. and what can we do? Can we win? Will we lose? So, the first and most important thing I think that that we concluded in in our in our study was that, well, two things. One, well, first of all, we can't do it alone. The time has passed when the United States can come on an expeditionary basis and save Taiwan. We're not going to do that. We have to work with our allies, including Taiwan, including Taiwan. And if we put all our forces together and coordinate them in the right way, then, and that's the second point, then we can, we can change the entire situation in regard to not only defending Taiwan, but warning the Chinese that if they think they're going to intimidate Taiwan, they got, they're making a mistake. Because that's what they're doing. You know, they're flying fighter planes and bombers around the island on almost a daily basis. They're running naval exercises, uh, the most recent just off of Okinawa, which is nearby, uh, threatening not only uh, uh, the Taiwanese, but threatening U.S. Marine installations and the Japanese uh, southern islands, too. So, you know, they did more than a thousand takeoffs and landings off of aircraft carriers. I mean, this is the sort of craziness that's going on. It's an intimidation campaign. Well, we can intimidate back if we organize. So the main finding, the most important finding of our group is that let's have a common command. You know, we have at the political level something called the Quad now, which also includes India, Japan, uh, the United States, but we, we, uh, Korea, but we need to include we need to include uh, Taiwan. Yeah, but we also need it at the command and control level, at the military level. Australia's in that? I've... Australia, yes. Yeah. Right. And not South Korea. I think I misspoke. Yeah. Um, India, Japan, Australia. But interestingly, not Taiwan. Not Taiwan. Well, not Taiwan's in, Taiwan's in nothing. We Is that one... because we didn't want to offend the Chinese? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a long... We don't, you know, part of the deal in 79 when uh, uh, Nixon... Uh, and Kissinger did their deal with China was to was to de-recognize Taiwan, and then it was seventy four. When was that? No, well the, the actual yeah seventy four. But the actual okay. Taiwan Relations Act was passed in seventy nine to try and compensate okay. for that. Yeah, um, and that was to de-recognize Taiwan. So they removed 
we used to have Marines on Taiwan. We took them out. Uh, we had bases there, took them out. Uh, we had an ambassador there and an embassy there, took it out. Mm. Uh, and, mm. and set up a kind of a strange system where we have, we have retired State Department people working in Taiwan under the, at, a, at an embassy we don't call an embassy. Uh, <laughs> that's really weird. But basically what we're saying is we must include Taiwan, to include them both in command and control level, include them for training, include them in exercises, and treat them like a real country, which they are, uh, bring in the, the Japanese who are dying to have this done, by the way. The Japanese are really concerned about China threatening Taiwan because they threaten Japan, and they understand that. So for the first time, we have a very sympathetic Japanese government that's not hiding. You know, in the past, they used to hide. But right now, they're, they're very much committed to try and do something. They want Washington to do something. The problem's in Washington. Problem's why in why Washington. am I not surprised? Well, it's been that way for a long time. Yeah. Um, and it was terrible under the Obama administration. It got better under Trump started to bring some officials to Taiwan, started to do a little bit of training there. And the nature of the problem in Washington is? Fear of China. Right. Simple, fear of China. But we shouldn't fear China. <clears throat> it's, giving, it's giving away everything up front. Why should we fear China? We should tell China that you know, we're more than prepared to, to uh, uh, do what we need to do to oppose any threat to Taiwan or to anybody else in the region. So when we say we, we mean the State Department? We mean the U.S. Well, but, but I think, of, I, I always try to get this boiled <laughs> down to, to which agencies, and I don't well, like to find uh, out which person well, it's which actually, agency. Well, but it's, it's, the, it's the White House. Okay. The White House makes this policy. The State Department, of course, has executed it for years, and happily, unfortunately, happily so. But, I mean, the world has changed. Well, there are people who believe, and I think I'm becoming one of them, that Biden is compromised with regard to China. And we don't need to speculate on that. I mean, you've written the series. But there is, but there is that speculation. Well, we stayed away from politics in the book. Which is smart. Yeah. Okay. I mean, totally away from it. Yeah. Uh, the book is serious uh, military and strategic analysis of what we can do to stop a... China invading Taiwan. And I think we've come up with a lot of uh, suggestions and recommendations and findings that there are 30 or four of them actually in the book. Uh, that, and many of them, by the way, don't really require us to do anything that requires huge expenditures. Uh, it really requires us to get our act together. Uh, to take a one government approach, that means all the agencies work together. The Pentagon, I think, is more persuaded than ever that this is a fight waiting to happen. So they're trying to get ready, but they're not really supported by the State Department and not by the White House. So, you know, we bring, and the CIA is on the fence. So I think we have to bring all these uh, agencies together as a one government, one government approach. The Chinese will understand that because they'll have no choice but to understand it. And that's the key point. And to realize that we have to work with the Japanese. They have a pretty good air force. They have F-35s, which is a stealth airplane. They have pretty, more than pretty good submarines. They have a small navy, but an excellent one. Uh, Taiwan has a pretty large air force uh, and, and a small navy. Uh, and they have pretty good ground forces. But we have to get all that organized, and we haven't done it. So the problem is not that we would have likely allies. We have every single major country in the region who would like to be part of it. And the problem is not that we don't have the technology or the, or the theoretical capability. The problem is our willingness, the elite's willingness to recognize Chinese an, an, an enemy. That's right. Not just a competitor. That's right. Well, which because is the, the way Chinese they're trying are... to characterize it now. Well, they're just, they're just competitors, you know, they're not really ever going to be an enemy. Well, that, that's, you look at what they're doing. Well, take a look at the South China Sea. Is that is that competitor or is that a threat? It seems to me when you put missiles and, and uh, all the other things, naval equipment and whatnot, that's a threat. So if we wanted to get a groundswell to support this, and these are good ideas, and we can find this book on Amazon. Amazon. And it's on Kimball, that's Stopping Kindle, a Taiwan yeah. Invasion. Right. Easy to find. Yes. Um, the line of action here, though, is to get Washington to rec to change our thinking about the nature of the China threat. Well, that's why we wrote the book, yeah. I mean, that 
that's the main. It's, it's, we also made it short so that people won't get confused. Uh, <laughs> it, here it is. You know what? You know, I've had a lot of guys that have written books on this show. Thankfully, this is the shortest one I've ever pushed. <laughs> it reminds me when I was young, uh, working for the Senate Foreign Relations 78 Committee. pages. We're good here. In 70, I guess it was 74, I went to Israel. I'm including your appendix. And uh, your I met with Moshe notes. Dayan. Yeah, 74. Go ahead, and, sorry. Uh, so I was a young Foreign Relations Committee staffer, and I got to meet the great man. And so in preparation, I read his biography. And it's, by the way, fascinating. And it's a great big, thick penguin book. And I read the whole thing. And I went to see uh, Diane, who was then the defense minister. And uh, I sat across the table from him like we're sitting. And, and I you know, was trying to be nice. And I said, you know, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, it's a great honor to meet you and, uh, and your illustrious career. And I read your biography. And it was absolutely, your autobiography. And it was absolutely amazing. He said, did you like it? I said, yes, I did. I said, I said, only that it's a really big book. He said, yes, it is. He said, do you want to know why? I said, yeah, tell me why. He said, they paid me 25 cents a word. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, I, so we didn't get paid by the word. In fact, we didn't get paid at, didn't at get, all. I mean, no. this, everybody in this... Group. No, this is a serious group of people. Everybody this in this group serious, volunteered their time, Proxy. including myself. Yeah. Nobody got paid a penny. Savage. And any proceeds, there would be very little proceeds from the book, but whatever there are will go to the Center for Security Policy. None of us will benefit from it. That, that, our intention was to do something for public policy. And, 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 and every one of the, these gentlemen, uh, both the military and civilians involved, were generous with their time. We spent three months working on this and uh, talking it out. We videoed every conversation. We used to Zoom to converse, and uh, so we videoed good everything. Chinese technology. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, we wanted them to hear. Yeah. <laughs> we do that all the time with, with the guys at YouTube. I've they weren't a foolish, you know. I mean, <laughs> they, they listen in all the better. Uh, and... Uh, and we also made notes of each meeting. And, and so, and then we went through all the notes. And then just to tell you the rest of the process, um, after I wrote the initial draft, uh, I got help on the Marine part, because I'm not a Marine, so I got people to help me on that. And then we circulated it to each, all of them, and asked for commentary. We got back a lot of commentary, a lot of you know, corrections, suggestions, modifications, some paragraphs. We incorporated all that, sent it back out again so that everybody could go over it again. Then we did the kind of editorial ed editing job, you know, typos and things. Any so. sharp disagreements? None. Okay. No, everybody's on board 100% um, with this. As I said, there's 34 findings and recommendations. So if you care about our security and you care about, if you worry about China being an enemy, not a competitor, this is the place to start to understand how we can do something about it. That's right. That's a, exactly its intention. And, and, and our guys, are, I know, are talking it up with their colleagues in the Pentagon now. Okay, great. Uh, that's just good. Right. Um, but I want the public to read it. Uh, I want the defense gurus, you know, who write about defense matters and to read it because that gets back in. And I want the State Department to read it because some of this is political in the sense that, you know, recognizing Taiwan as a real partner is absolutely crucial to the outcome of this problem. I want to do a part two with you if you're willing to speculate. We've got to wrap this up because we're about done. But it seems like we're now moving into how much of this is political versus how much of it's strate strategic. And I think I worry that We've got people in our leadership that don't take this problem as seriously as they should. Well, or don't have the education in the background. Okay, we'll help them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of ignorance out there. Let's face it. Okay, well, let's work. We'll, okay, so to be continued. Uh, this was, TBD. This is, this TBC, is our second TBC, show. I can't wait to have you back on. We've been here with uh, Dr. Stephen Bryan talking about Ukraine and China and 
Taiwan and maybe our enemy within and what we ought to do, what we need to do to protect our uh, America's national security. Stephen, great. Thanks for Thank being here. Thank you very much for having me. And we can find you where? At the Center for Security Center Policy. Center for Security Policy. Yeah, yes. I did. Center for Security Policy. Uh, Frank Gaffney would, uh, would kill me for not mentioning that. So <laughs> anyway, glad Well, you the book is published by the Center for Security okay. Policy. Okay, great. And, uh, and, and they did this beautiful design of the cover and the back cover and so forth. That's nice. Uh, That's good. Did a nice job. Okay, thanks we'll again. see you again soon. Thanks, yeah. and uh, thanks you all for joining. And uh, uh, stay tuned for our next uh, next subject or next show on this and and other related topics. And as always, we're here to find out what's true, what's right, and what's next. Part of the reason why I want to do this show is that just there's so many of these so-called complicated things people don't understand, and they're really pretty simple if you can just get, get it out there, get to the heart of it. Yeah. Um, well, I think people want to understand. I mean, the, the, it's amazing. I, I've talked to a number of groups uh, about both about Ukraine and about Taiwan, both subjects, uh, sometimes both at the same time, like we did. Um, and I get very good reaction. So I think people say, well, I hadn't heard that before. Well, and I think also I was guilty of this. I mean, a lot of us thought China, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, you know, private equity world, my world, well, we're going to go do business in China. Make a bundle. Make a bundle. They're going to make a bundle. They'll become more like us. They'll become democratic, and we'll all join the world order. We're all going to live happily ever after. You know, after. that's the same argument that Kissinger made about the Soviet Union back in uh, in the early 70s uh, when the detente was all the fashion. Uh, if we just give these big loans to the Soviet Union build these fertilizer plants, uh, build these truck plants, uh, you know, all that stuff. Uh, the, Ru the Russians will become our friends. Well, I'm just, I'm just learning about a lot of this because I was wasting all my time on Wall Street before I got into and I was, this I was fighting with Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I understand it, the, the first Bush administration fought hard to keep the Soviet Union from collapsing. True. Like Condi Rice was not was was, you know I don't remember it quite that way. But well, how do you remember? Because I'm, I'm I think I'm everybody to piece was. These I puzzles. think Washington was completely in shock. I mean that the thing collapsed. Okay. I think there was worry that this coup. Remember the coup against Gorbachev? I do. I mean that was pretty frightening to Washington because they they saw that as as a. You know, that was a coup from the hardline side. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. The KGB in the military. Um, and I think Washington's reaction was, you God, this could be really terrible. Um, but it turned out to be, it's turned out to fail. I mean, that was the good news of it. I don't know if it would fail again. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read every one, and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining. <laughs>